So welcome everybody to this today's BIH lecture, which is to be held by our two awardees of the BIH Excellence Award for Sex and Gender Aspects in Health Re Research of uh, 2021. And we are very happy to have you here today, but I have to give two apologies before we start, because first, uh, one of the awardees, Professor Jeanette Erdmann, is unable to attend today. She informed us yesterday that she is ill and she cannot be with us today. So we wish her our warmest um, to get better very soon. But um, I think we will um, have her in the next year to give her lecture about the BIH Excellence Award. Um, second is uh, that I have to... Uh, give my warmest welcome also from uh, Professor Christopher Baum, who is unable to attend today because um, he has to attend the meeting of the Charité Supervisory Board, where is, he is um, in the Vorstand and uh, so he is unable to be with us today. He would have loved to moderate himself, but he wants me to bring his warmest regards and he um, wishes you all the best because he is um, very well aware that this excellence award is uh, very important for the BIH. Um, uh, he uh, he is very um, aware that the different manifestations of diseases in women and men are still far too rarely taken into account in medical research projects. And with this award for sex and gender aspects in health research, we want to help to close this gap. So um, he is very pleased that this year's Award winners are recognizing uh, the BIH, um, uh, um, a very high caliber male and female scientists um, who are supporting the BIH in this endeavor and at the same time are valuable cooperation partners in uh, the BIH's mission to advance medical translation. So um, let me uh, just uh, briefly explain what is the BIH um, uh, Excellence Award for Sex and Gender Aspects in Health Research. Uh, the award aims to bring more visibility to sex and gender issues in translational research. It recognizes research excellence among scientists working in the field of biomedicine who integrate sex and gender aspects into their research. The award focuses on both the research impact of the applicant and their future research collaboration with a partner from the BIH. And in bringing the laureate's expertise to Berlin, the BIH aims to connect the award winners with scientists at the BIH, thus facilitating the development of a joint research project that serves the BIH's mission of turning research into health and focuses on sex and gender aspects. So um, unfortunately, Professor Janet Erdmann cannot be with us today, but we are very happy that Professor Hans Knoll can be with us today. And um, I will introduce him a little bit to you. Um, Professor uh, Ralf Knoll is a chief scientist at the British Swedish pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca and a principal investigator at the Department of Medicine Hudinge at the Karolinska Institute in Stockholm. He was recruited from Imperial College London, where he was professor and chair of myocardial genetics from 2009 to 2014. And he was formerly head of a research group studying cardiovascular molecular genetics at the University of Göttingen. Hans Knoll has studied medicine in Gießen and Frankfurt, and he has a strong interest in genetics, physiology and pharmacology of the cardiovascular system and his re translational research aims to unravel the epigenetic mechanisms underlying the biology of human cardiac disease and to use these findings as a basis for developing new therapies for heart failure. So, um, Professor Knoll, we are very happy to have you here because uh, we heard all that you might have some difficulties in flying to Berlin because the Berlin airport yesterday was um, had difficulties in uh, arrive, having uh, some airplanes arriving because of the climate activists blocking the airport a little bit. But so maybe you have some delay, but you are here with us today and we are very happy. And um, 
I give you the word now for your talk, Basic Science, Novel Modalities and Innovative Therapies for Heart Failure. Please, the stage is yours. Yeah, thank you very much, um, uh, Frau Seltmann, for this uh, very kind um, introduction. And um, <clears throat> of course, I'm very proud to be one of the recipients of the BIH award. And uh, I'm really grateful to you for um, having recognized um, my and our contributions. And um, as you already said, this is an ongoing collaboration. And I'm in my current presentation, I will show some of our um, data. So I'm not sure, can you see my presentation? Okay, good, very good. Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> again, thank you very much um, uh, for um, recognizing my work and also the work of my um, collaborators here um, at the BIH and uh, for having received um, the BIH award. Um, I'm going to talk about basic science, novel modalities and novel therapies for heart failure, which I very much hope our collaboration will contribute to the development of novel therapies to treat heart failure, particularly heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or heart failure um, with a diastolic dysfunction. So let me um, start with um, <clears throat> focusing a little bit on the epidemiology of heart failure and particularly the economic aspect of heart failure. Now, um, it is estimated, and this is a conservative estimate that we have worldwide about 26 million patients affected by heart failure. We can also say that uh, uh, the worldwide costs to treat heart failure exceed by far more than 100 billion US dollars worldwide. And heart failure represents one to 2% of all healthcare expenditures in the United States and North America alone. And this is, we have probably 30 to 40 billion um, uh, US dollars per year. And this is going to double until the year 2030, where we, have, where we will have more than 70 billion US dollars alone for heart failure and cardiovascular diseases. It is probably also important to point out that the five-year mortality of heart failure is similar to cancer or various types of cancer, and this is about um, uh, 50 percent. Now, I do not believe that I have to tell in front of this audience too much about heart failure with reduced ejection fraction <clears throat> versus heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and the diagnosis. But nevertheless, um, it um, is important for my presentation. What you see here in this echocardiography on the left is a heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So the heart doesn't contract properly. And this is what we generally understand of heart failure. However, during the course of the last 10 years, a second type of heart failure has been discovered, which is called heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. And you will appreciate that on the right side, the heart contracts very well, but there is also a defect in, in the relaxation of these hearts. And this is called a diastolic heart failure. Now, heart failure with preserved ejection fraction does not have a proper genetic basis. So not much is known about the underlying genetics, nor are known therapies possible, nor is there much known about gender effects. All three are at the center of our collaboration here. Yeah. Now, when I say that there is no known therapy, um, this is going to change right now. So at least when it comes to genetic heart failure, there is a novel drug coming um, to the market, which is called Kamsus or Mavacamtain, or formerly known as MIP461. And this is a drug inhibiting the myosin ATPase, and particularly for patients with mutations in the um, beta myosin heavy chain affecting this myosin ATPase leading to hypercontractility. Now this compound can be used for patients with this type of mutation and can be described as a personalized medicine approach to specific types of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. There are other drugs I know, SGLT2 inhibitors might also be um, useful, um, but we have to see that. Now, what causes heart failure? Classically, we say that um, from a pathology 
point of view that coronary artery disease is the major cause, maybe responsible for 70% of all heart failure cases, followed by hypertension, heart valve diseases, and on fourth position come cardiomyopathies, which have a strong genetic basis. That's what we know. Myocarditis, arrhythmias, congenital heart disease, all of which have also strong genetic basis. So in other words, if we would look for causes of heart failure, we would, we, we would say that genetic causes are the major cause of heart failure. Nevertheless, I'm going to tell you a little bit more. Um, within AstraZeneca, we had a focus on genetic heart failure and um, we looked for the open um, databases such as OMEM or ClinVar, one is more stringent, more is one um, of these databases more relaxed. But when we analyzed those um, uh, data sets, um, we came up with more than 5,800 cardiomyopathy variants located in at least 134 different cardiomyopathy gene load sign. And then we looked for coding sequences, for the impact, pathogenicity, population allele frequencies, and so on. And when we finally focused on cardiomyopathies, we um, came to the following picture. And this is, you see this Venn diagram, you see in bluish the dilated cardiomyopathy cases, in more um, uh, light you see hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in greenish you see arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, and um, in, in pink you see um, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Now probably the two most important cardiomyopathies, there are many more, I know that, but the two most important cardiomyopathies appear to be dilated cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, what you see here in these red circles um, is um, a number of genes to which we, during the um, uh, last years, uh, contributed and which have now been um, established as cardiomyopathy candidate genes. We have also um, uh, generated and provided the scientific community with a vast uh, array of different um, genetically altered mouse models. And you can see that in this um, blue arrow. I would like uh, to point out myosin binding protein C knockout animals and also myosin light chain 2 pseudophosphorylated um, mice. I will come uh, to that more later because they are at the center of our collaboration. <coughs> what you see here is a schematic diagram of a cardiomyocyte. You see in the outer, um, in bluish, um, uh, you see the cytoplasmic membrane on the left upper. You see the sarcomeric, um, the sarcomere, and um, uh, at the bottom you see a magnification of the sarcomere. On the right, upper right, you see the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is a calcium store, um, and you see also um, a mitochondrium at the uh, uh, lower right side. Now, um, when we focus now on cardiomyopathies, we have to say that the top genes causing hypertrophic cardiomyopathies, which is a type of, um, or which can be regarded as a type of hypertrophic, of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, there are two major genes, beta myosin heavy chain or and myosin binding protein C. And those mutations affect the super relaxed state and alterations in calcium sensitivity. And this is a cause for diastolic dysfunction. And on the other side, we can say in dilated cardiomyopathy, we have probably 50 or 60 um, candidate genes, but the, by far the most important candidate gene appears to be titin. Titin affects more or less the systolic and diastolic um, parameters of myocardial function, depending on uh, the domain involved in the mutation um, present. Now, we can also say, and this is also well known, that calcium metabolism is defective in, uh, in heart failure. And here is particularly CERCA, the calcium ATPase pump, which pumps calcium into the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And phospholamban, PLN, abbreviated here on the upper right um, in red, is a major inhibitor of CERCA. And um, what we can also say is that um, in heart failure, energy metabolism is particularly important. And energy metabolism also is associated with the generation of reactive oxygen species. Now, oxygen species play a major role in heart failure. I will briefly come to that um, soon. Um, again, I 
just picked three, four major hotspots for heart failure research. Um, this is a cardiomyocyte centric view. I did not talk about other cell types such as fibroblasts or endothelial cells, which are also important in the pathogenesis of heart failure. We did not talk about time dependent evolution of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction ending up in heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, systemic diseases with systemic and significant cardiac involvement have not been mentioned. Muscle dystrophies play a major role. Um, inflammation and anti-inflammatory strategies are important. And I did not yet go into personalized medicine, which is also possible when we talk about specific mutations and specific types of heart failure. But nevertheless, we can focus um, on these three, four major mechanisms. Now that we have seen the genes involved, and the physiological um, consequences of those mutations in, in terms of translation and medicine, we have to think how can we interfere with these um, uh, physiology and pathological conditions. Classically, we can say we have small molecules and this is what we know in medicine for decades. And the majority of our drugs we use in heart failure are based on small molecules. However, during the course of the last 10 years, much more modalities have been um, established and provided. And I named just a few here. One is we can use modified RNA, means we can just inject mRNA into an organism and this mRNA is translated into a powerful protein. We have seen that um, with COVID-19 vaccines, for example. But then microRNAs and antagomeres appear to be very powerful. We can design antibodies um, and we can also generate combinations of which, for example, antisense, oligos and um, antibodies and so on. We can also use Protax. However, in my presentation, I will focus a little bit more on gene therapy and therapeutic genome editing and oligonucleotides, antisense, oligos. And um, I will show you a few examples soon. Now, um, I'm sure you know um, a lot about um, bench to bedside, which is very important in translational medicine. You need first some in vitro data, and then you need some positive small molecules, small animal models. You need large animal models, um, human induced pluripotent stem cell technology, and of course, clinical trials before a drug can be administered to a patient. However, I would like to make two points here. During the last 10 years, it became extremely important um, to work with induced pluripotent stem cell derived cells. And this technology can't be overestimated because this is the closest we can get in vitro to a patient because here those cells carry exactly the same genetic landscape which we find in the patient. And this is very hard to reproduce in vitro. So this type of cell is very important. Another important issue is um, during the course of the last three, four years, there's a major move away from, um, um, or in other words, there's a major move towards um, the use of non-human primates and cyanomolgus, et cetera, because they are much closer to humans. And um, this model appears to be a very powerful tool to make sure when we treat patients, um, we are on the right track. So two important points non-human primates and iPS derived uh, stem cell technology appears to be very important in novel drug development. Now I'm going to provide you with some examples. So one of which is antisense drugs, which target RNA via the Watson Creek base pairing. Here is a very simple um, slide. You see the central dogma <clears throat> of molecular biology. Our DNA makes RNA makes protein. And the idea is to use, to generate or to design and produce an antisense drug, um, which finally ends up in a hybrid with mRNA. And every RNA DNA hybrid is immediately degraded by RNA's age. So and the idea is you have less RNA and this means less protein. And this is a very powerful approach. Now, antisense oligos can also be used for other approaches. You can use upstream open reading frame sequences and to um, regulate gene expression. Um, antisense oligos um, can be used to interfere with uh, splicing and so on. 
But for now, we will use, we will focus on RNA DNA hybrid. One of our recent projects was that we focused on phospholamban. Um, the point is that we here collaborated with a company in the United States, in San Diego, California, Ionis. And here um, the company designed and, um, uh, and generated antisense oligos and tested those. And what you see here on the lower right is that these antisense oligos, we've, um, the company designed and generated a few antisense oligos, um, ended up in the degradation of uh, phospholamban mRNA. And this is what you can see here. So we have uh, a functional antisense oligo. Now, in a collaboration with um, a group in Groningen, um, which focused on the um, phospholamban R14 deletion mutation, um, we applied this approach. Now, it's probably important to point out that this phospholamban R14 deletion mutation is a frequent mutation, especially in the Netherlands, and is associated with severe heart failure and life-threatening arrhythmias. Now, these mice have a very severe phenotype. The homozygous mice die within the first 10 weeks after birth. So it's a very severe phenotype. Now, when we treated those mice with these antisense oligos, we have been able to show that we can significantly improve left ventricular ejection fraction. So you can see here in this red square. Um, and we can also decrease the diameters and volumes, such as left ventricular and systolic volume, and left ventricular and diastolic volume. And most importantly, this resulted in a significant improved survival of these animals. You see the red line is the natural course of survival. After 10 weeks, these animals are more or less, they, are, they pass away in such a strong phenotype. However, when we treated those animals with these antisense oligos, they more or less survive. So we have a very powerful tool in hand here. Next, we used MLP or CSRP3 knockout animals. Some of which, some of you will be familiar with this model. It's a, um, it's a ubiquitously used and well uh, known model of genetic dilated cardiomyopathy. And when we treated those animals with antisense oligos, we were able to significantly increase left ventricular ejection fraction left, and also to decrease the volumes in systole and diastole pointing out to uh, beneficial effects of these um, antisense oligos. And finally, we also um, employed a rat myocardial infarction model. I've pointed already out that myocardial infarction and uh, coronary artery disease is the major cause of heart failure. And when we treated those rats after myocardial infarction with antisense oligos targeting phospholamban, we have been able to show that these animals develop much better contractility, as you can see here, by a significant increase DP per DT. So to sum that part up is that when we go for specific phospholamban mutations, such as, such as the R14 deletion, um, we can um, significantly improve survival. Uh, we have less protein aggregates, which I uh, did not talk much about, and uh, we improve function. When we use a genetic heart failure or dilated cardiomyopathy model, we can also show that we, with these antisense oligos, we can improve left ventricular ejection fraction. We can also improve cardiac relaxation parameters. And when we use a, an important myocardial infarction model, again, we can show beneficial effects in form of contractility and um, in form of contractility. Now, we have three mooring models of dilated cardiomyopathy, which we studied, included the important phospholamban R14 mutation, the CSRP3 MLP knockout mice, and myocardial infarction. Phospholamban functional defects are causative to the pathology observed in phospholamban, and they contribute to the pathology in the CSRP3 MLP knockout animals. And consequential, um, we can improve myocardial performance in those animals. Um, in our myocardial infarction model, the fossil lamp azos also restored cardiac dimension and contractility. So 
this is a very important uh, tool and um, we will see um, uh, how far we get with um, interference with phospholamban in heart failure. Now, what you see here is a, um, a list of um, uh, antisense oligos already in the clinic and they entered the clinical scenario probably in the last three to five years or some of which are on the market only for one year. And these antisense oligos are um, the, the, probably the top company here is Ionis in the US, but other companies are also active such as Sarepta or Pfizer. And these antisense oligos, they can be applied to a wide variety of different um, uh, uh, diseases such as amyloidosis or Duchenne muscle dystrophy or spinal muscle atrophy. Now I'm coming more to our um, collaboration. Um, what we see here is myosin binding protein C. Um, this is a large 150 kilo Dalton protein. It's encoded by the myosin, bind myosin binding protein C gene. Um, it's arranged in the C zone of the A band. Uh, on the right side, you see a schematic diagram of the sarcomere. And again, you see a magnification. And what you see on the, on the top part, on the upper part of this magnification is the actin troponin tropomyosin complex. And at the bottom in yellow, you see myosin. And you see on the left, you see all of the myosin head. The myosin head interacts with actin and via use of ATP, this causes the sarcomere to shorten because the head, the myosin head moves. Now, what you see, in, what you see interfering is myosin binding protein C. Myosin binding protein C can also be seen because it interferes with the uh, myosin actin interaction. Myosin binding protein C can also be described as a break. It, um, it interferes with uh, myosin actin interaction. But myosin binding protein C function and myosin heavy chain function depends on uh, a crucial protein. And this is also what you can see in this red square on the left, it's called regulatory light chain, abbreviated RLC, or is also known as myosin light chain 2V, abbreviated MYL. And this small protein is particularly important uh, for um, uh, a diastolic function and it has a strong impact on myosin binding protein C function as well. Now, I mentioned it before, myosin binding protein C is a major human disease gene and uh, the mutations in this gene are associated with significant increased risk of cardiomyopathy and heart failure. Now, what we observed when, when we generated these myosin binding protein C knockout mice was that myosin binding protein C knockout mice have excellent systolic function. And this is what you can see here, even after dopamine um, uh, challenge, um, these hearts uh, perform very well, but they have a problem. And this is what you see here. Um, you see um, uh, a defect in relaxation and you see these white squares with these uh, significant stars. They indicate that these muscles do not relax as good as wild type animals and um, uh, and heterozygous animals um, do. So these mice have a defect in their diastolic function or it's a form of heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Now, what does it have to do with myosin light chain 2V or regulatory light chain? I'm not showing you all the data, but it turned out that we saw hyperphosphorylation of regulatory light chain in those myosin binding protein C knockout animals. And we performed a variety of experiments in vitro and in vivo. And we also generated pseudophosphorylated myosin light chain 2V knock in mice. And those mice um, have been analyzed here in our um, collaboration by uh, Professor Carsten Tröpe, Professor Sophie van um, Lindhout, and also Dr. Um, Kathleen um, Patritz. And what we observed here is you see some echocardiography parameter. So one of the most important um, uh, data sets was that the cardiac deformation parameters such as global longitudinal strain and global um, radial strain um, was significantly increased. So showing after eight weeks and the same after one year that um, these hearts 
um, perform very well when it comes to deformation parameters. However, the most important point here, um, and um, this is data coming directly from our collaboration, is that those hearts have a problem with their relaxation. So, and this is what you can see here, dp per dt min, so the relaxation parameter and tau, the relaxation half time, um, are se severely impaired. And what we also um, can say when we look in more detail, and this is also a discovery from the um, uh, uh, Berlin group here, um, Professor Carsten Schöpe, uh, Professor Sophie van Lindhout, and also Dr. Kathleen Papritz, that we have a gender effect. So we see here that males and females react different. So here we have clear differences in terms of their myocardial performance. And this is something very interesting and something quite often in basic science overlooked, namely the namely the gender effects and sex differences between males and females. And this is um, at the center of our um, currently ongoing collaboration. Now, what we can also say, and we have seen that in these pseudophosphorylated regulatory light chain or myosin light chain <coughs> uh, uh, knock-in mice, that this is probably something where we can um, um, modify um, the diastolic properties of hearts, and we might be able to do so in a gender specific way. But this is at the center of our collaboration, and um, uh, we have to see how we um, continue to work here. So, I also briefly would like to um, uh, introduce you to, to another. A very interesting project, and this is um, based on therapeutic genome editing. I believe I don't have to tell you much about CRISPR-Cas9 here in Berlin, um, uh, but uh, for now I would like to stress out that uh, CRISPR-Cas9 or therapeutic genome editing uh, can be um, applied to a vast variety of different organisms, including Homo sapiens, yeast, nematodes, saprofish, rat, mice, you name it. Now, I pointed it out earlier, one of the major causes of heart failure is coronary artery disease. And hypercholesterolemia is a major risk factor for um, uh, heart failure and uh, coronary artery disease. Recently, um, drugs have been um, approved, such as alirocumab and evolucumab, bepata, prioluent, apart from siRNAs, such as inclizan, um, and they all target a protein called PC, PCSK9, which is a circulating protein, which degrades low density lipoprotein LDL receptors. And by inhibiting this PCSK9, these therapies increase the LDL receptors on the cell surfaces, and in consequence, reduce LDL cholesterol. All therapies are currently um, uh, uh, in, um, in the clinic and uh, are powerful tools. Now, we have thought about how, because some of those hypercholesterolemias are genetically determined, and maybe we can develop a therapeutic genome editing approach to target, um, uh, to target uh, PCSK9. And for this purpose, we designed and generated a humanized mouse model. Um, we are carrying the human PCSK9 gene, and then we um, designed an all-in-one adenovirus, which, cause, which included Cas9 coding sequences and guide RNAs. And with this approach, we were able to specifically target with high efficiency the human PCSK9 gene in these humanized uh, mouse model. And as a result, we were able to significantly decrease cholesterol values uh, and parameters in these mouse models. Such, well, Therefore, um, we have developed a therapeutic genome editing approach for, um, for PCSK9 treatment in um, hypercholesterolemia, and we have to see um, whether we can even go into clinic with this approach. So let me provide you a brief overview. Now, for genetic heart failure, um, there are now several approaches and modalities possible. 
So we can either directly interfere with the mutation in a sense of personalized medicine. I've um, described just a, a therapeutic genome editing approach targeting PCSK9, but other approaches are also possible. For example, we could uh, target or destroy a mutant allele and so on. Um, I gave you examples for antisense oligos. Um, they can be used for exon skipping, for example, target nonsense mutations, or we can uh, target uh, target genes such as phospholamban. What recently during the last two, three years became also possible is RNA editing. In contrast to therapeutic genome editing, this is a non-permanent approach, which can be uh, uh, of advantage because therapeutic genome editing can also um, have some side effects and, um, uh, and um, this can be detrimental. So RNA editing is also a um, very clever approach uh, for gene therapy. Now, we can also interfere with the pathways affected. So for, for example, in all types of heart failure, we have myocarditis or types of inflammation, hence anti-inflammatory strategies are possible. So interleukin-1 beta is possible. We can target antioxidative pathways, for example, heme oxygenase overexpression. But again, we have to keep in mind there have been some clinical trials and they were not necessarily successful. For example, the Bardoxolona and Beacon trial. Um, so in other words, we have to be very careful and we have to dissect the available data and to design our clinical trials and strategies accordingly. Now, we can also interfere with cell death pathways. So blocking apoptosis is also an approach. Now, when we go into more detail, we can also say that heart failure with reduced ejection fraction can possibly be targeted by um, Zerka 2A, by targeting Zerka 2A, which is downregulated in many types of heart failure. Again, one has to be careful. Um, the Cupid gene therapy trial, where Zerka has been overexpressed in heart failure, was not necessarily successful. So again, one has to dissect the available data carefully and um, one has to design the therapy appropriately. We can also say that we can interfere directly with actin myosin interactions. Um, Amgen's Omicam Tif Mekabil is, um, um, is, is uh, one way. Uh, we can modulate contractility also via interfering with myosin binding protein C and, my, and possibly via myosin light chain phosphorylation. And this is at the center of our collaboration. Again, this might even be possible to be done on a gender dependent um, uh, way. And heart failure with preserved ejection fraction is probably most difficult. Um, here we may have um, CAMZEN, uh, Mavacamtain from myocardia coming up. We might also have some novel therapies when we target um, a titan. Um, and um, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors, I briefly mentioned, that might also be an opportunity. And in summary, ever more powerful ASO technologies will, en will enable us to target previously so-called undruggable targets. We can also improve the specificity via specific um, strategies of these antisense oligos. Um, we have now seen robust extrahepatic activity of antisense um, oligo technology in preclinical and clinical studies. So this is um, a very powerful tool um, and a very powerful novel modality for um, innovative um, uh, medicines. I did not talk much about a large unmet need for cardiac cells type specific therapies. Um, this is probably more um, uh, experimental. Um, uh, other novel therapies are coming up um, based on oligonucleotides, um, also CAR T cell therapy um, and um, therapeutic genome editing approaches, which have been designed and are in the pipeline in uh, several large and big pharma companies targeting, for example, Duchenne muscular dystrophy. And last but not least, again, our myosin light chain, regulatory light chain phosphorylation approach is uh, likely poses a novel target for drug development, possibly in a gender specific way um, in our collaboration. And um, this is my acknowledgement slide. 
And again, I'm grateful to my um, collaboration partners, Professor Carsten Schöpe, um, Professor Sophie van Lindhout, and Dr. Kathleen Pappritz. And I thank you for your attention. So thank you very much, um, Ralf Knoll. We are very happy with your talk. I'm very interested in your talk. And uh, may I ask the first question? You um, mentioned some um, knockout mice with the myosin binding protein C, which is of importance in gender aspects, I understood from your talk. Have you done this in female and male mice, this knockout? So well, to look, in order to look for the differences between male and female parts? That's a very good question. Um, as far as I remember, um, in these mice and binding protein C knockout mice, we did not necessarily look for gender specific effects. Um, but thanks to my <laughs> collaboration partners here in Berlin, they had a, a, a very sharp eye and they immediately pointed out when we worked with these um, uh, pseudo-phosphorylated regulatory light chain mice that we have gender effects. And this is something very important um, because these gender effects have been underestimated. So from a clinical um, a point of view, we know that, um, uh, that females or women uh, are, have, or, or the, 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 from, from the epidemiology, it is clear that females suffer much, much more female, much more women suffer from heart failure with preserved ejection fraction than men. That's point one. But men die much more often from heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So in other words, men die off heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, while women die with heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. Mm -hmm. Now, why am I pointing that out? We don't know the molecular mechanisms. We really don't know that. But it's very important to find out why women um, can tolerate this much better, obviously much better than men. And mm -hmm. what are the molecular mechanisms? And it might be that this phosphorylation of regulatory light chain gives us one clue, and we might be able to play around with this phosphorylation of regulatory light chain and to develop a novel therapy. Mm -hmm. So the sequence of this myosin binding protein C is not different in- No, 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 it's not, no, 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 that's a good point. No, but, but, but to the best of my knowledge, there are no, um, uh, um, uh, there are no differences in the sequence between um, uh, men and women, definitely not. Okay, so, so what do you suppose? Is this uh, an effect of the hormones? <laughs> what? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah, it's, it could be. It could be um, an effect of the hormones. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And let me just also, be, I mean, um, I know you have also, um, them, particularly in Berlin, there's a strong interest in, 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 in gender uh, aspects of medicine. And um, I think Professor Vera Rigit Sakrosek uh, yes. funded or created um, a gender. Um, Institute and, and this is also well established and, and mm. uh, internationally well known. Um, but it tells us also that this has been um, underappreciated in the past, you know, for a variety of reasons. You know, um, so if I, in my, I mean, I, I, I definitely spent my, my 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 professional life in um, in translational research, and um, it was always whenever we saw some data which did not fit together. Um, so the first question was uh, separate females from males, you know, and when uh, they are different, yeah. And then we, the, in general, it was like that, oh yeah, we, we take away the females and then we talk with the males um, because it, the general argument, you know, it was always the same for many years. So yeah, it's too complicated with these hormones, estrogens and so on. Yes. Um, so, in, and, and the result of that was because we have also been from the journals and from papers, you know, the editors, they want to have clear cut stories and, um, you know, and then you, and, 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 and when you start with gender dependent um, differences, um, things become complicated immediately. And um, so in general, um, all these publications um, with experimental 
animals, they focus on males, unfortunately, okay. because of that. But but this collaboration and but my, you will I, now change this situation exactly we, <laughs> due to the yeah. BIH Excellence Award. Uh -huh. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And 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 okay. as I and as I said, this, this discovery that there are gender differences between hmm. um, uh, the phenotypes, and this is very okay. interesting because it immediately opens because I'm you know, I'm a translational scientist so for me it's immediately it flashes up hmm, how can we use it how can we can we treat patients uh, males females different um, okay, how can we exploit that you know and we have to have a keen eye you know, really a sharp eye on, on on the data and we have to see how we can exploit that for the innovative um, medicines. Yes, this is already the first question will this gender differences influence the choice of therapies? Most likely, most likely, most likely. But as I said, this has always, I mean, in our, I think, was it yesterday or two days ago when we had this, uh, um, 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 our, our preparatory meeting, you, you immediately pointed that out, um, these gender um, aspects. But there, there is not so much during, you know, it came up only maybe, particularly with the, via the work in Berlin, I mean, not mm. only, but, but Berlin certainly made, um, uh, was leading the way here. So these gender um, effects, they, they have never been properly, um, I don't know, you know. Okay, so here's another question. Just let me read it to you. Mm -hmm. um, most of the mentioned approaches are gene specific. What is the potential patient therapy group? Only patients with primary genetically induced heart failure? That's a good, that's a very good question. Um, the point is here, that in modern pharmacology, even big pharma becomes ever more interested in rare diseases. So let's say during, until 10 years ago or so, um, uh, big pharma was only interested in these blockbusters, you know, generate um, uh, uh, a compound which makes maybe- For everybody. One, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, one, something for, for everybody. This is also one of the reasons why gender effects have never been studied. Okay. But it comes ever more. It becomes ever more clear. The more genetics we know, um, it turned out that we can um, treat patients much better when we know about the precise cause of the disease. And um, for example, in heart failure, we, we know lots about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and we know. I pointed. I briefly pointed out to that. We know that beta myosin heavy chain mutations increasing ATPase activity. They are the major cause, one of the major causes of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Of course, you can the hypertrophy, you can treat beta blockers, you can use calcium antagonists, you can all that. But but this is again something one for all, and, and for, for one patient may benefit from that for another mm -hmm. one because his hypertrophy is true due to a specific mutation, it might be even detrimental. So mm -hmm. in other words, um uh, this um, uh, 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 that we know something about the underlying genetic cause helps us to specifically treat a patient and to improve and, and to, to really make him benefit from mm. a, um, a therapy. I understand that uh, this is demanding and um, that this is not easy. But as we have seen with, with, with now with the upcoming gender effect, this is absolutely necessary. No? We have 99.9% .9 of the same genome, but this 0.01% difference makes, makes, makes a, the a difference. Makes the difference. Yeah, mm -hmm. yes, exactly. Even in the heart. So let me just ask uh, for the, your collaboration with your Berlin partners. Uh, as I mentioned, the prize was already given last year. And uh, so we had uh, difficult times with COVID and uh, have you already started to meet each other? Have you visited yes. uh, Berlin before? Have you seen Sophie yes. van der Kout and yes, absolutely. Uh, absolutely. Um, uh, so um, uh, I was I was educated in Berlin at the Charité in, uh, in uh, Klinikum Steglitz. At that time, um, uh, it was uh, free university. Um, in the department of Professor Schultheis, where I was working, where I was an assistant together with uh, Professor Carsten Chöp. So we know us, we, mm. we know each other. And mm. this was probably also the, 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 the focal point for, for our uh, collaboration, because I know he's doing excellent work um, when it comes to hemodynamics and analysis of um, small animal models. And we collaborated, we successfully collaborated before. So I came up, or we came up um, with this mouse model. Um, we had meetings, um, I think we just spoke, I think three years ago, um, 
just before the COVID um, uh, breakout, but with this COVID thing, everything um, more or less, um, uh, let me put it like that, significantly slowed down because we couldn't work in the laboratory. Um, mm. A personal meeting was definitely not possible. Um, mm. But um, I can assure you, we, uh, my, uh, we have accumulated um, a tremendous amount of data, which I did not necessarily put um, in this presentation because it's still preliminary and early. Mm. Um, uh, but um, uh, we, we have data related uh, to a titan expression, mm -hmm. uh, whether a titan expression is different between males and females. Titan is particularly important for the diastolic function. So far, we did not see that. But what we saw is, and um, particularly Dr. Papritz um, showed a few data just a few days ago, that males, male hearts appear to have more fibrosis or at least collagen, more collagen one in the fibrosis. Mm -hmm. And um, fibrosis in the heart is never a good sign. So, mm -hmm. you know, this is, still, this is still experimental data. To which extent and how this phosphorylation of regulatory light, light chain um, is linked to fibrosis, we have to see. Uh, but we see that males have more fibrosis and this can possibly be um, a cause why if we can extrapolate them, I mean, it's still early um, to patients. So if males have more fibrosis in their hearts due to heart failure with preserved ejection fraction or phosphorylation yeah. regulatory light chain, so this is not something good. So this could be something, um, uh, 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 this can be linked to mortality and could explain the increased mortality in males versus females. Mm. And mm -hmm. maybe from that point of view, we can, I mean, this is early, you know, this is still experimental yes. and there are a few steps to do. But one can, can think of hmm, maybe a heart failure patients, males, men, need more antifibrotic strategies, you know, so that we can probably stop or interfere um, the um, uh, generation or the development of fibrosis in these hearts. Mm -hmm. So that could be mm -hmm. something we can think of. And this could be something which can come out of our um, collaboration. Yes. Uh, which is um, uh, uh, running very well. I mean, we have online meetings as well. As mm -hmm. I said, um, uh, data are coming in. We are still analyzing gene expression. Um, so I think it's a very good, exp um, it's a very good um, collaboration. So, okay. And uh, I think uh, during the pandemic, we also learned that men die more easily from COVID-19 than uh, women. So maybe um, more researchers and more journals are aware of these differences so maybe what do you think for the future will the journals accept more uh, data from uh, two sexes and not only want to have clear-cut uh, data sets with um, uh, not that's, confounding yeah. results mm -hmm. no that's a very good question um, I believe um, our sensitivity, also the sensitivity in the scientific community, and this includes also probably the editors, which I hope um, that we need to do more gender-specific research. And um, and I, I'm, of course, I'm as a member of the scientific community, I believe in the quality of science. And as long as um, we produce excellent uh, data, we will also be able to publish in excellent journals. Um, so, so from that point, um, I am optimistic that uh, we can really make um, a difference here, yeah? Okay, so we hope you will make a difference. <laughs> Together and, with my uh, partners here in Berlin. Yeah. Yes, I hope you will collaborate and we are very keen to see your results in next future. And uh, thank you very, very much for your most interesting talk and um, we wish you all the best for your collaboration and your future research. Thank you very yeah, much. I thank, thank, I thank you. And I'm very happy um, again to have received the BIH award. And I'm very happy with collaborating with Professor Carsten Schöpe, Professor Sophie van Lindhout and uh, Dr. Kathleen Papritz. It's really an excellent collaboration. I'm really grateful to you. Thank you. We are happy to hear this. <laughs> So just let me announce uh, next the next BIH lecture, which will be held uh, live <laughs> on site um, once again after two years of COVID-19 pandemic. It will be held 
on December 9, uh, again, Friday noon, and in, in the Einstein Saal of the Berlin Brandenburg Academy der Wissenschaften. And uh, it will be held by Dr. Stephen Goldman from the University of Rochester Medical Center in the United States. He will be in Berlin and talk about progenitor cell replacement for the treatment of glial disease. Glial disease, I don't know how to pronounce it. And I think it will be most interesting and uh, it will be in partnership with the German Stem Cell Network. And we hope, of course, to see many of you then and now I would like to thank you for your attention and to wish you all a very happy weekend. Thank you. Bye-bye.